Good afternoon. My name is Gigi Stortz, and I'm a member of the Lambda Lunch Interest Group, which is hosting today's Walls Lecture. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Na Diane Newman. Dr. Newman is a professor of biology and geobiology at Caltech, as well as an investigator of the Howard Hughes Institute. So Dr. Newman is actually from this area, from Virginia, uh, grew up in Alexandria, and has moved sort of between the West Coast and East Coast since then. She was an undergraduate at Stanford and then received her PhD in environmental engineering at MIT. Um, my understanding is that through some classes that she took as a graduate student, Dr. Newman became interested in bacterial genetics. And to learn more about this area, she carried out postdoctoral work with uh, Dr. Roberto Coulter at Harvard Medical School. Um, since that time, Dr. Newman has really melded her backgrounds in geochemistry and bacterial genetics examining interesting metabolic reactions carried out by bacteria um, to shape the chemistry of their environments. And recently this work um, has shown or she's found that some of these reactions, uh, for example, which can lead to the generation of redox active antibiotics have medical relevance. Uh, Dr. Newman's ability to so successfully bridge two fields as illustrated by the awards she has received. The Geochem, for example, the Geochemical Society Best Paper Award, and then the National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology. She's also a member of both the American Geophysical Union and the American Academy of Microbiology. And I think this bridging of these two different fields will also be illustrated in her talk today. Um, and the title is The Importance of Growing Slowly, Roles for Redox Active Antibiotics in Microbial Survival. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Newman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gigi and Susan and everyone else who was involved in inviting me to come here. I am very much honored to be giving this talk in this series. And as uh, Gigi said, I grew up in Northern Virginia, and yet I never had the opportunity to visit the NIH before. And so for personal reasons, um, this has been an exciting day for me as well. And I've really enjoyed the conversations and interactions I've had um, so far on this visit. So thank you. So what I thought I would attempt to do, um, since this is a general audience, is talk about something that I've become fascinated by um, in the past decade, but begin with a framework that is broader than the particular topic of chronic infection, because I hope it will help you understand the way I look at problems and how important I think a broad perspective can be, actually, in thinking about problems. And so the specific problem that I will go into in some depth is how in chronic infections uh, bacterial pathogens survive. Um, this is a very important topic about which we still have much to learn, but I think it is fair to say that it's well recognized that the altered physiological state of many bacterial pathogens in chronic infections really can underpin physiological resistance to standard antibiotics. And so learning more about what this state really comprises is one rational path to being able to treat these infections better. However, to really ground this sort of problem in a bigger context, I want to point out that you know, when we look at organisms in this environment, and what you're, you're seeing here on the slide is an image of Staphylococcus aureus uh, that has been um, growing and thriving um, in the mucus in the lungs of individuals with cystic fibrosis, uh, it's actually poorly constrained um, in many, many ways. Uh, and 
often how we study these pathogens in the lab doesn't necessarily capture so well what's really going on in situ. And let me, let me begin with just a very simple example of this and take the concept of growth rate. And I'm going to do this for one of my favorite organisms, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because that will mostly be what I discuss in today's lecture. So conventionally, uh, even in my own lab, um, you know, when we started off, we would often grow pseudomonas in rich medium, uh, shaking aerobically. And when you do this under these conditions, the growth rate um, is doubling times of about a half an hour, okay? And, and that's fairly common. There's good reason that we do experiments like this. It can be very reproducible. And indeed, an incredible amount has been learned over many, many decades uh, through taking this kind of approach. However, um, I also teach uh, introductory biology at Caltech, which is to an audience of students who are quite quantitatively minded. And so to help um, them you know, get interested in, in microbial growth, I have them do a calculation. I ask it at this rate, um, what would the volume that a single pseudomonas cell occupy uh, uh, after three days of growth? And it turns out that it would fill the volume of the earth. <laughs> and so they can extend this, and after less than a week at this rate, it would fill the volume of the observable universe. And so, well, obviously we all appreciate this isn't occurring. Um, I think it does convey in a very simple way, but yet a powerful way, the fact that these growth rates are really lab artifacts. And in the environment, obviously, this is not what is going on for many, many reasons. Um, one of the reasons that I think uh, is important to reflect on that I personally have thought a lot about coming from a background in geochemistry is that in many environments, and for much of uh, microbial history, uh, the Earth did not have oxygen. And so if we just look at uh, three important gases and their relative concentrations over time for the history of the planet, um, what you see here in blue is the rise of oxygen, and in red, methane's profile, and in green, carbon dioxide. And well, I think many of you may appreciate that the rise of multicellular life is relatively uh, recent on a geologic time scale, you know, dating to about a half a billion years ago at the Cambrian explosion. Microbes have been dominating uh, the biosphere for the majority of Earth history, and for a large portion of that time, you know, they have been evolving and thriving under conditions that were either entirely anoxic or hypoxic. And so this is part of their history. And so when we put these facts together, that growth rates must be slower than we often study them, and the fact that you know, there's been this incredible span of time in which organisms have evolved metabolisms that had to exist in the absence of oxygen, we can begin to think a little bit more deeply about the micro-niches that characterize microbial habitats today in many, many different contexts. And so I'm going to start this lecture by talking about an environment that's more geological in relevance, but rapidly move into one that has um, important medical uh, implications. Um, and let me link these two uh, for you conceptually. So let's begin first with thinking about what happens in sediments like this. Uh, these sediments are from the Hayway Reservoir in California that supply a lot of the water to the city of Los Angeles, and they're comprised of iron oxide minerals. And Within these sediments, you have bacteria that are thriving, and they're thriving because they're able to breathe these rocks. And that's an amazing process. And so here's an organism that can do this that's been well studied. And its name is Shimonella onidensis, strain MR1, isolated by Ken Nielsen from Lake Oneida uh, in New York State. And if you look at this, what you see here, these are cultures that are forming aggregates. We call these biofilms. Um, and they're forming in this particular picture on a piece of corroding steel that when it corrodes, it forms a layer of ferric oxyhydroxide minerals that are the same kind of minerals that you see in those hayweed sediments. And so some bacteria are attached directly to these iron minerals, but then as they form these clumps, uh, they get at a distance from the iron oxide. And so if you were to make a cartoon version of this and flip it and cut these clusters, you know, in half and look at them on their side, what you could imagine would be you would see a stacking where some of these cells, individual cells, are attached to the mineral surface. 
And then you have some that are embedded in the core of what I'll now start more and more referring to as biofilms. And then some that are on the top that can access molecular oxygen in the waters above. And people have been studying biofilms um, in so many different organisms. And one of the things that's very well appreciated is that after you reach a certain critical um, size of these films, the rate of oxygen consumption outpaces the rate of diffusion. And so large portions of these biofilms are anoxic or hypoxic. So something that really interested us is how would a cell in the middle of these biofilms metabolically survive? Because it wouldn't be able to access the iron oxide directly, nor could it access molecular oxygen, an alternative electron acceptor um, in the broad scheme of metabolism. And so how might it respire? And so if we think about this at the level of a single cell, if oxygen you know, can diffuse across, in this case I'm showing the cell structure of a gram-negative bacterium that has an outer membrane and an inner membrane, or cytoplasmic membrane as written here. This isn't such a hard thing to envision. We know that oxygen is permeable and can come into the cell where it receives electrons at the end of the electron transport chain and the inner membrane. But for an iron oxide mineral that is sparingly soluble, um, it simply cannot diffuse all the way in here. So there has to be another answer. And over the past, at this point, I would say, you know, even almost three decades of research, um, many different groups, I had some involvement, but many other groups have been involved in understanding the pathway of electron transfer from inside the cell where electrons are generated by the burning of carbon sources going through central metabolic pathways that ultimately wind up um, being dumped onto iron oxides outside of the cell via a series of interesting proteins, many of which contain C-type cytochromes. And some of these are even on the outside of the cell and can come in close enough contact with iron minerals to reduce them directly. However, as I showed you in that first conceptual cartoon, if the cell isn't close enough to the iron mineral, there has to be some other way of dumping those electrons. And so researchers in this area of environmental microbiology um, in the 90s really elaborated on this idea that there were things called electron shuttles that could be a varied composition, organic or inorganic compounds, that conceptually, as shown here very simply, have the ability to interface with the cell where they pick up electrons from cellular metabolism and then transfer abiotically outside of the cell those electrons to an extracellular oxidant, in this case iron. And you can have very small amounts of these because they're catalytic, they can be recycled. And so this might be something that could help explain how things worked at a distance. And so when my lab got involved in thinking about this problem, something that we recognized was that environmentally important electron shuttles, as they were referred to in the geoscience community, such as um, compounds called humic substances, they're these large uh, macromolecular organic uh, compounds that have moieties such as those you see here, quinones, that can be um, mimicked in a simpler format by a model compound such as anthroquinone disulfonate. You know, these were well appreciated to serve as stimulating iron reduction in groundwater aquifers, um, various places around the East Coast. Uh, but what we recognized was that structurally, they had quite a lot in common with other small molecules uh, that were known as antibiotics. And yet, when you look at these particular types of antibiotics, they're united with these electron shuttles by virtue of the fact that they are all redox active. They can all uh, gain and give up um, electrons, often coupled to two-proton um, transfer as well. And so my group postulated that possibly a solution to how microbes might exist in these environments where they lack an oxidant is if they were able to self-generate what I like to refer to as an endogenous electron shuttle, and that in certain contexts we might have thought about these things as being antibiotics, um, but under other contexts they actually might be serving a very important physiological function for the cells that produce them. So that's the, the broad background that now leads me into the depth of what I'd like to tell you about today, which is how this might work, how we tested this notion in a specific context. Um, and that context is the mucous environment that collects on the surface of the lung cell epithelia in patients who have the disease cystic fibrosis. And within these lungs, 
over time, a complex microbial community um, can accumulate and this composition of the community can be very different from patient to patient, yet it's fair to say that amongst the pathogens that over time grows to be very successful in this habitat is the organism Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa is interesting for many reasons, but for me, uh, we selected it because it produces these beautiful molecules called phenazines, whose structure you see here, uh, this nice aromatic uh, ring uh, that has these nitrogen moieties that are where you can exchange electrons on and off. And depending upon the particular phenazine that you're considering, they come in literally every color of the rainbow. Here are four important ones that are produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You will have different uh, chemistry um, at these positions decorating the ring, and that can tune the properties of these molecules up and down uh, the redox spectrum in terms of their uh, potential, in terms also of their hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. It affects their properties in a significant way. So to illustrate the redox activity, let me show you this film. So what you're looking at here is a culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that has come out of you know, a shaker, and what we can do is play with it on the bench where we have a little vortex uh, machine down below, and you can just sit here and take your culture. If you're bored, it's very relaxing, and you can aerate it, and as it gets uh, oxygen, it changes color. I hope you can see that um, from the screen here. Now, over on this side, what I'm showing is the reaction. What's going on is that there's one particularly dominant phenazine called piacyanin, which is colorless when it's reduced, so it's made inside cells, and then it's excreted outside the cell in its reduced state. And when it encounters oxygen, um, this reduced piocyanin gets oxidized, at which point it turns blue, and it transfers its electrons um, onto oxygen, generating reactive oxygen species. Okay, and then the oxidized phenazine is taken up by the cell. It gets reduced inside the cell and excreted out, and this is a very regulated process. We understand what the transport machinery is to some degree and how the cell senses these molecules and regulate its transport. Now, because these molecules react with oxygen for good reason, for many, many years, they were considered to be toxic secondary metabolites. Um, and the major um, driver of the toxicity uh, has been attributed to the ability to generate superoxide. And due to this process, phenazines have been shown to harm neutrophils and other bacteria in their environment and to contribute to virulence in a variety of infection models. And all of this is absolutely correct and very important. However, what we realized as we were thinking about the phenazine biosynthetic pathway is that with the exception of the phenazine piocyanin, every other phenazine can be made under strictly anoxic conditions. And moreover, the regulation of the biosynthesis of these molecules occurs at late stages of cell growth and is triggered by quorum sensing, which I believe you'll hear a lot more about next week in this lecture series from Pete Greenberg. So phenazines were well known to be coming at the end of growth as sort of an end stage of the quorum sensing regulatory cascade in Pseudomonas. And you can see this here when you just grow these cultures. If you look at this figure in black, this is uh, depicting the growth curve, the cell density, the optical density over time. And here, at the point where they reach the tail end of what's called exponential growth as they're transitioning into a parent stationary phase where you see the culture um, just maintaining its high levels of cells but no longer um, multiplying at the population level. Uh, this is when phenazines are made. And coinciding with this time point is when oxygen, if you measured in these cultures, is no longer detectable. So thinking about this, we had an alternative complementary hypothesis, which was at this phase of their existence at high cell density and under low oxygen tension, which I would like to underscore are conditions that characterize biofilms in any habitat, whether it's on the surface of a rock or within aggregates embedded within uh, CF patient's mucus. Um, these are two uh, attributes that you see over and over again, and that they might be playing important physiological functions at this state. And so what we um, 
put out as an idea is that they are secondary metabolites only in terms of time. Simply uh, because they're produced at a later stage in no way implies anything about their ability to be important physiologically for the cells that produce them. It just means that we have to reflect on the conditions of the cultures at this time to find potential physiological functions. So that's what we set out to do. And this was you know, the overall context that we just transposed from thinking about this problem in the context of iron minerals. You have the same situation here where you have an infected uh, epithelial surface and you have hypoxic mucus. The challenge at the cellular level for this cell is essentially the same from that aspect. It's limited for oxidants. So how does it survive? And so now for the rest of this talk, I want to show you the data from our studies that helped us explore and test this idea. And to do this rigorously, uh, much of what framed our work was the context of the mucus within the lungs of CF patients, as I mentioned. And there were three specific questions we had that I would like to now address and lead you through. The first and deceptively simple question is, how fast are the pathogens growing within this environment? Um, amazingly, we know very little about how fast bacteria are growing in any environment. And so this seemed like a good place to start for reasons I'll mention in a moment. Second, we wanted to think harder about what might be limiting um, these growth rates. And once we understood that, uh, begin to explore coping mechanisms. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this work, developing our um, methodologies for asking and answering these questions in the context of the sputum that collects on the surface of individuals with cystic fibrosis. And the reason that this was an attractive environmental sample um, to work with from the perspective of uh, being amenable to addressing the questions that we sought to address was because it was so easy to acquire. Individuals with CF every day cough up, expectorate their mucus. We can collect it at the hospital. And we've been doing this in collaboration over the past five years um, with people at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And so at the CHLA, CF um, Pediatric Clinic. We have a little space in the clinic where we can harvest uh, the sputum as it's coughed up and we can take it and manipulate it immediately um, after expectoration. So that's something that we can do in bulk. And then we can bring these samples back to Caltech for analyses at the single cell level. And so to address the first question, how fast are they growing? We needed to develop a method to measure growth rate. And this was actually a very hard thing to do, um, to get an accurate proxy for growth rate in situ. And so what I will now show you is how we approach this both for measuring mean growth rates and measuring the distribution of growth rates at the single cell level. So one of the um, privileges of working at Caltech is that I get very um, talented students and postdocs to join my group. And I had a brilliant PhD student, Sebastian Kopp, whose background was in isotope geochemistry. And in collaboration with my colleague Alex Session, who's an organic geochemist, we came up with um, an approach uh, that gave us the ability to uh, quantify growth rates in this environment. And the strategy essentially works as follows. We make use of the fact that we can incubate these sputum samples in deuterated water for very short time points, allowing the pathogens within the sputum to be exposed to deuterium, H2, heavy water, and to incorporate a certain amount of this deuterium as they grow into newly synthesized fatty acids. Now, the hard part comes in analyzing them. We have to be able to pick a fatty acid that is diagnostic for a pathogen we're interested in. This fatty acid has to have particular properties of being synthesized de novo, not recycling things in its environment. There are many important controls that I'm not going to go into now, but I'm happy to explain later. But the bottom line is that what comes out of this is that we can extract very specific selective fatty acids that meet the criteria we need to do this quantitatively and analyze them using GC pyrolysis um, IRMS. So this is gas chromatography um, and mass spectrometry in order to measure very trace amounts of deuterium uptake. And so when we do this and calibrate the amount of uptake uh, under different growth rate conditions, we can 
come to a place where we are able to actually approximate the growth rate from real human clinical samples. And so this is what we found. And so what I'm plotting for you now are samples that have been taken from many patients in a cross-sectional study at CHLA. I think we have um, 37 samples from 16 patients shown here in this graph. And to begin, let me just again note that under standard laboratory cultures, the way we go after drug development, um, normally the growth rates are in this zone. And what's immediately apparent when you look at this is that the average uh, growth rates that we're looking at, that's inferred as a weighted average of two very specific um, uh, fatty acids in the pathogen Staph aureus, um, which was used in these studies, all of them here, the circles, are well um, below the standard regime. And across all of these patients, though there is considerable variation, overall the average rate of doubling is approximately two days. Now that may sound slow, but the very good news, and I think the very important news, is this is absolutely tractable to laboratory studies. And so one can use chemostats, for instance, in order to control the um, exposure of these organisms to nutrients at a slow enough rate that you're able to channel their growth into rates that are relevant you know, for the actual in situ environment. And I'll come back to that. So this is the bulk rate. What about at the single cell level? Well, again, making use of the interdisciplinary departments at Caltech, we were able to go to the Geological and Planetary Sciences Division where they have something called a nanosims. And so this is a secondary ion mass spectrometer that allows you to detect isotopes within um, cells you know, at incredibly small scales of resolution uh, accurately and resolve their composition isotopically. And so one can couple this to fish fluorescent in situ hybridization to identify particular organisms from a sample. So here you're again looking at one of these um, sections from a very small bit of actual sputum from a cystic fibrosis patient. And here we're staining now for a particular um, cell type. And then here in this channel what you're looking at is the ionic composition. And so we have a positive control of particular ions that we expect to see in every living cell. And now here we see the channel that will only show us the incorporation of deuterium. And so by making many standards and uh, doing a whole variety of uh, controls that again I won't show here, but I, I refer you to these publications if you're interested in, we were able to be quantitative and to assess at the single cell level the density distribution function of growth rates for different populations within this actual mucus. And I think what's astounding is the variation. It's really, um, really striking over very small spatial scales. And so here, as an example of this, you see four different patients. In red are species type one. And as you can see, these density distribution functions, um, while they overlap between patients, you have different skews uh, to the distribution function uh, that's quite heterogeneous. And you can resolve density distribution function growth rate differences between species at the single cell level in situ. So this is very exciting and opens up now all sorts of um, experiments one can do to begin to understand more deeply why it is that certain populations are growing faster or slower. Um, and we can discuss that more later. But to return now to the bulk environment um, and ask the question, what is limiting? What are one of the things that could be limiting? Uh, we return to our thinking about oxygen and its um, importance in many environments and what are its real concentrations at the micro scale. And so the great irony, uh, given that the environment that we're looking at here is the lung, is that within the sputum that collects in the lung where we take in oxygen, we find very good evidence, as I'm about to show you, for very substantial zones of anoxia where these organisms are thriving. So here is just a schematic depicting different parts of uh, the pulmonary system. And we can model uh, different regions, whether it's a clogged um, alveolar sac or within a very small bronchiole, a layer of sputum that is uh, collecting in one of these uh, pipes. There are different ways we can begin a simulation to begin to calibrate an expectation for oxygen at spatial scales that are relevant. I'm going to now just give you one illustrative um, data set here from 
modeling we did looking at a bronchial where we estimated a distance of around um, 500 microns and asked, what would the oxygen concentrations be in this mucus? Now, if we cut this pipe and we look in two dimensions uh, within such a small tube, under different concentrations of cells, given, uh, given respiration rate for oxygen. And so this is what you're looking at here. This is the thickness that we're assuming for mucus as it begins to clog uh, these, these bronchioles. And here, going across, where you see different estimates for microbial abundance. And the important thing to appreciate is that as you go from purple to red on the scale, we're going from oxygen concentrations that are at equilibrium with the ambient air to regimes that are totally anoxic. And what this very simple um, simulation predicts is, of course, kind of intuitive. The thicker the mucus clogging and the higher the concentration of cells respiring, the faster um, you will drive towards a state at equilibrium where you would expect there to be very little oxygen. So how does this actually map to measurements? So we went after this um, by making use of microelectrodes. And here is Elise Cowley, an intrepid tech in my lab who's now going on to grad school. And what she did was set up a camp here at CHLA where she was able to take the sputum immediately upon expectoration and measure oxygen concentrations, redox, sulfide, and pH, and for all of these, you also need a reference electrode in samples as soon as we were able to transfer them um, to her system. So this is within about five minutes of expectoration and reflects as best we can the in vivo environment. And so here's what she saw, just as an example. In profile after profile, in collecting the sputum as it's coughed up, what we find is that there is a very steep oxycline where we go rapidly from equilibrium with the atmosphere through a hypoxic region into a regime that's devoid of oxygen. This was not surprising from the model. What was surprising and fascinating were the extremes of redox potential changes that we observed concomitant with this shift in oxygen. And what I'd like to draw your attention to here is that these lower uh, ranges of redox potential that you're seeing um, are compatible within the range that's known to typify various phenazines uh, that are produced in this environment. It's also consistent with sulfide, which we've detected here. And so there can be multiple things that contribute. But for now, let's focus on the potential relevance of phenazines in helping underpin survival in an anoxic realm within this context. So the first thing we had to ask was, well, are phenazines present at concentrations that could be important? And if so, what are those concentrations? And so in an earlier collaboration, actually, with Children's Hospital Boston, we collected a data set that we then replicated at CHLA, and this is the data from CHLA shown here, that shows a correlation between the concentration of the phenazine pyocyanin and the lung function, which is measured by a metric called the forced expiratory volume in one second, the FEV1 value. So the lower this FEV1 value is, the more severely impaired the lung is. Um, this is observable in these axial tomograms here that show you the range of FEV1 values for individuals whose lung function is mild to moderate to severely impaired. And what I hope you see clearly on this slide is that as lung function declines, the concentration of the phenazine pyocyanin rises very significantly. Um, in data that I'm not showing you here, what we also saw was a very um, striking uh, correlation between the concentration of pyocyanin predicting the rate of lung function decline. And so that seems to be um, a very useful clinical parameter that's uh, a diagnostic for where one would expect lung function health to be going. In any event, this satisfied criterion number one. Within these lungs, there's phenazine. Um, and the question is, are the organisms uh, growing in biofilms within these lungs uh, where the environment could be hypoxic? Uh, there had been very good data from Pete Greenberg's lab many years ago indicating quorum sensing molecules were produced in this habitat. That's also correlated with biofilm formation very strongly. Um, but we wanted to be able to devise a method to actually perceive and see these biofilms in situ um, in order to understand them more deeply and ultimately get to a place where 
where we could look even for the expression of particular genes in situ that um, our laboratory experiments had suggested might be implicated in survival. So to do this, we teamed up with um, a great young colleague of mine at Caltech, Viviana Gradinaro, who comes from the bioengineering field and neuroscience in particular. And she was part of a group at Stanford that developed a method called Clarity that's been used in brain imaging. Uh, and what it does is allow for tissues to be cleared, to become optically transparent. And we thought, well, maybe we would be able to adapt this methodology for looking at microbial populations within the sputum, or frankly, within any um, sample. I think this has a lot of uh, potential extensions um, for people who here in this audience might be studying uh, the human microbiome. Um, this is a method I'd be very delighted to share. So in the context of the lung, what happens is that we take sputum that's expectorated. We've also started doing this actually with lung transplants too. Um, and we subject them through a processing that helps us go from a sample where you can't see anything in it to one that is optically transparent. And then at this point, we're able to image them. And using uh, methods that amplify um, the ex breast gene that we want to track or a ribosomal RNA gene that might give us the ability to track a particular microbe in uh, a community, we can begin to find them in this big uh, mass of sample. And so in orange, you see the lectin mucus. In blue now, these are what we believe are neutrophils. And in green now, these are bacteria um, that we've uh, identified using a broad probe for uh, bacterial ribosomal RNA that's specific um, for all bacteria. From this, we are able to scan large volumes at a time, um, identify where the bacteria are, and then become more uh, able to ask questions such as, well, what is the volume that they occupy? And so here I just thresholded above um, 100 uh, cubic micron threshold for size in this um, particular slice uh, through the sputum. And what I think is important to appreciate is that in vivo, uh, the vast majority of the bacteria we see are in this class where they're clustered in aggregates. Aggregate biology is really defining the majority of cells in this habitat. And that's very different from how we often grow them in the laboratory where they're shaken and they typically occupy um, clumps that are of much smaller skies. So why is this relevant and how does this bring us back to phenazine? Well, if you recall, one of the initial ideas was that as a cell is growing in size and mass and no longer has access to oxygen, the ability to utilize these redox active shuttles might enable it um, to uh, be functional. And so now returning to a simple uh, in vitro system where we can uh, do experiments um, that are reductionist and more well controlled, we asked the question, could phenazines play a role in biofilm development? And so here you're seeing an experiment where we are comparing the wild type to a mutant that overexpresses phenazine to one that is unable to make it at all. And we're going to now follow just simply the morphological development of these what we call colony biofilms over the course of a week. So after one day, they basically look the same. After days, uh, three days have elapsed, they start to diverge. And by day seven, they look quite different indeed, with the phenazine mutants occupying a much larger surface area and creating these beautiful wrinkles, whereas the mutant that overexpresses these phenazines remaining nice and tight and smooth and becoming ever more blue in color due to the growth of the phenazine pyocyanin. So returning to this conceptual model from the beginning, um, we wanted to ask the question whether or not, as we might predict from our model, um, could it be that the wild type is able to occupy a volume within these um, biofilm structures that lacks oxygen and still survive in the absence of oxygen because of the presence of phenazine, whereas the phenazine mutant would be restricted only to zones where oxygen could be detected. And again, we used our microelectrode system to help us make the measurements to answer this question. So Lars Dietrich, a former postdoc in my lab who's now a professor at Columbia continuing this project, um, did this beautiful work that I'm showing you here. And we had the advantage of a wonderful digital microscope that allowed us to actually visualize these biofilms um, at a level of resolution that could be quantitative in three dimensions. And you can see this here, where what you're looking at is now um, a topographic rendering of the surface of these biofilms. And what's so great is that it's on the scale, and so we can make 
very precise measurements of depth uh, within these structures. And when we do this and couple uh, these kind of quantitative measurements of uh, the size and, and width of these structures to measurements where in these same wrinkles here or at the base, we stick microelectrodes concomitantly and see how low can we go to detect oxygen. Here you see the, the setup. Um, it's actually fairly simple. It's just growing in these petri plates, and here's the microelectrode penetrating. We can uh, ask where within these colonies are the oxic zones, and does that correlate with the cells? Um, as we would expect. And so we did an experiment where we measured in both the wrinkle and the base under well-controlled concentrations of ambient oxygen. And I can't see any of you because of the shining light, but maybe you should do this thought experiment before I show you the data. What would you anticipate as you crank up the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere? Would you imagine that the wrinkle structure would get thicker or thinner? <laughs> hard environment, I guess, in which to do a Q&A. So I'll tell you and show you the data. But think about that. What would you predict? I'll give you a moment, and then I'll show you the experimental result. And what would happen when you cranked it down? And then the other key question is, would there be a difference between the wild type and the mutant? So what we saw, the intuition I hope you, you had, was as you crank up the oxygen, the width would be expected to increase. And this would be true regardless for the wild type or the mutants, as shown here. So what you're looking at now is for um, oxygen ambient concentrations of 15, 21, and 40 percent. Uh, the depth, the measured depth of colonization uh, within these uh, structures for in gray the wild type and in white the phenazine mutant. And in all cases, as you crank up the oxygen, that depth increases, which is predicted. And what was very satisfying and exciting, however, to us was to recognize that the difference that one saw between the wild type and the phenazine mutant, the depth where oxygen became unmeasurable, um, really limited the growth of the phenazine mutant, whereas the wild type was able to occupy a space and volume that exceeded the regime to which we could measure the oxygen. And so that was very important um, because it helped you know, validate within this context of biofilms that phenazine cycling may be able to indeed promote anaerobic survival. So we wanted to understand that in greater depth. How does it promote anaerobic survival? Through what metabolic pathway is it exerting its effect? And to answer this, we actually shifted into um, a different way of setting up this experiment, where we actually began the growth curve at the place where many people end the experiment. That is at stationary phase at high cell density um, under anoxic conditions. And so we did these experiments in anaerobic chambers where we could grow cultures um, in systems like these, where we were able to have an electrode serving as the working electrode to oxidize phenazines that we added at discrete concentrations based upon what we had measured in the CF lung as being typical values. And to make things simple, we used a mutant that couldn't produce its own phenazine so that we were able to be quantitative in inferring how many times a cell would be cycling a phenazine based upon the amount of current being generated at the electrode. And so knowing the cell density, knowing the phenazine concentration, and measuring the current, uh, we could infer under these conditions that cells were cycling these phenazines um, approximately you know, 50 times for a molecule uh, for a given cell. So they were really shuttling. And the key finding here is that under these conditions, in the presence of glucose, what we found was that we could observe physiological um, survival as measured by colony forming units when we take cells from this chamber and then plate them. Can they grow up? Are they still viable? When the electrode was turned on to recycle the phenazine, and then the cell reduces it, excretes it, and then it gets reoxidized here. So that's the reason why you need the electrode on is to recycle it. Um, but if you turned off the electrode or if you didn't add the phenazine, then the cells uh, would die much, much more rapidly than here in the presence of phenazines where cycling was enabled. So that was um, an exciting finding. And what made us think that this was actually biologically really significant and potentially part of the evolutionary history of this pathogen was the observation that all native phenazines produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa promote survival, yet synthetic electron shuttles do not. And we believe this has to do with intimate structure function um, 
uh, requirements for transport and for chaperoning uh, the molecules within the cell in a way where they facilitate survival but don't cause uh, toxicity. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate on that later. But why is it that they're promoting survival? So what is it that the cell is getting from the process of reducing uh, these phenazines that allows it to do better? And so as a clue, um, Nate Glaser, a talented student in my lab, started measuring the metabolites that were produced um, in these survival chamber experiments at different stages. And something that he observed was that in the presence of phenazines, uh, this is in the presence of the phenazine uh, carboxylic acid, PCA, he saw an uh, increase in a peak um, that we knew to correspond to that of the metabolite acetate. Now, it's been known for a long time, and I have learned from some of the conversations I've had today that this is a pathway many of you in the audience think about too and find interesting, which um, made me happy. <laughs> uh, and it's also known it to be important you know, in other organisms, E. coli uh, amongst several, um, that during uh, survival and, and during um, infection, one of the ways a cell can generate energy, of course, is through um, pyruvate fermentation. And so we were doing our experiments under conditions where we gave the cells glucose, since glucose can be converted to pyruvate. I'm simplifying now a lot of uh, metabolic pathways so it's not too busy, um, and showing you really the parts that are the most important. So as glucose is oxidized to pyruvate, um, when we get to pyruvate, cells uh, can take that and ferment. And there are different ways this works, and one way that it can work in Pseudomonas is by reducing the pyruvate to lactate, thus enabling the oxidation of NADH to NAD+. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme um, lactate dehydrogenase, LDHA. And then that pyruvate, as in any coupled fermentation, this reductive arm is coupled to an oxidative arm where pyruvate gets oxidized to acetate. And a very important step along this pathway is the last one, where an enzyme acetate kinase, ACA, is able to take an intermediate and from that intermediate transfer a phosphate group um, in order to generate ATP. And this step is critical in uh, providing ATP uh, that can support energy generation under anoxin conditions. Now, what is predicted by this um, is that in the presence of phenazines, uh, the ability to go from pyruvate um, and make lactate may not be necessary uh, because one could achieve flow through this arm of the pathway uh, by regenerating NAD plus by virtue of dumping electrons from NADH onto phenazines, and that phenazines then, uh, through help from the electrode, could be reoxidized, allowing this to turn over and enable flux through this pathway. And what we knew, interestingly, and I'm not going to go into the reasons now, is that under the conditions of our experiment, um, this particular uh, enzyme uh, is not active. And so we hypothesized that in our survival assay, we could make a mutant uh, defective in this, and it would survive just fine in the presence of phenazine, um, but not in the absence of phenazine. Whereas if we made a mutant in this pathway, in particular um, in any of these steps, and I'm just going to focus here on the ACA mutant, then it would be defective in survival. We speculated that the energy that was coming from this step was key in helping it survive. So that's now the data I'm going to show you. And so let's first compare the survival curve for the wild type. And this is, again, under anaerobic conditions in the presence of glucose and phenazine. Here's a control with the wild type in the absence of phenazine. Um, and what we see clearly as predicted, with the absence of the enzyme ACA, the cells can't survive, even if they're given glucose and phenazine. And yet, uh, the mutant that doesn't make uh, LDHA does just fine in the presence of phenazine. Now, does this mutant um, do fine in the absence of phenazine? Well, one would predict um, that its NADH to NAD plus ratio would be um, uh, off in the absence of phenazine, um, and that in the presence of phenazine, it would be higher, and that's what we found. So the LDHA mutants in the absence of phenazines has a much lower oxidized NAD plus to NADH ratio than in the presence of phenazine. And this correlates very um, beautifully with viability in this assay. And so what that then suggested um, was that we would see uh, 
greater acetate production in this LDHA strain in the presence of phenazine than in the absence, and that this would translate directly to the amount of ATP that we would find in these cultures in the presence of phenazine um, uh, compared to in the absence. So to me, the reason that I think this is um, interesting and potentially important is that it expands our thinking about the metabolic pathways available to this cell in this environment. And oftentimes it's hard to predict just from a biochemical map, um, you know, from the genome, what metabolic pathways may be occurring, particularly if we're not considering exogenous metabolites that might affect flux through those pathways. And so it will be um, interesting to see uh, the extent to which uh, this typifies reactions that might be more broadly important um, in both both nature and survival physiology in the context of infection. And so bringing this back now to the growth rate experiments I showed you earlier, what motivates me to think that um, this is a mode of metabolism that bears experimental focus is the fact that the rates of doubling that we are able to measure under these conditions are very relevant to the regime that we saw as being important when we made these in situ um, growth rate studies, okay? And so what that raised to us was, I think, the much broader question, which is, you know, up until now I've been focusing on the role of a particular kind of redox active metabolites in supporting survival, but really a much more profound question is what underpins anaerobic survival in general? And I think that there's a lot of room for fundamental discovery here, and I'm going to give you just one taste of this, um, and with that I will end, end the talk. And that is to step back and take an agnostic um, point of view and ask, under these conditions, what are the cells doing? You know, as I said earlier, oftentimes um, transcriptomic, proteomic experiments are done under conditions where cells are growing rapidly, often in the presence of oxygen. Of course, there's a lot of great work done under anaerobic conditions as well. Um, but there's not a lot of work done under slow growth rates, particularly under anaerobic conditions, which might be very important. And so we took this condition of the survival assay mediated by phenazines, and we asked um, what is being expressed with the proteome. And so I actually need to correct that. We did it on the pyruvate survival um, condition uh, as a fermentation, uh, not in the presence of phenazine under these conditions of this particular experiment. And if you're interested, uh, this paper, I think, is coming out in just a couple weeks um, in PNAS. So in collaboration with um, my colleague Dave Terrell, whose lab um, in the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Caltech pioneered a technique called BONCAT, uh, which stands for the bio-orthogonal non-canonical amino acid tagging approach. Um, what that allows you to do is to identify proteins that are newly synthesized at a particular point of time. You can even do this at a particular place in space, um, but I won't talk about that right now. Um, and we adapted it to our anaerobic uh, survival condition. And so what we did was an experiment comparing the proteome that was being actively synthesized at that time uh, between aerobically grown cells and those under our anaerobic survival conditions. We found different proteins that were either unique in one condition or the other, and then a large number that overlapped. Of this large uh, overlap, uh, we found 41 that were significantly higher um, in their production under anaerobic conditions, but also seemed to have some relevance under aerobic conditions. And so we decided to focus on one uh, because it was completely unknown. It was a small protein um, of unknown function, and we thought, well, this would be an interesting one uh, to pursue. And so two phenotypes that made us interested in it um, are the fact that this particular protein that here I'm calling SUT-A, for a reason I'll explain in just a moment, in the absence of this protein, um, the cells are not able to make biofilms. This is a metric for biofilm formation based on a crystal violet assay that just stains biomass attached to a simple plastic tube. Um, Compared to the wild type, they don't make it as well, but if you overexpress this protein, they're able to make um, much thicker biofilms. And similarly here, we saw very significant differences in the ratio of different phenazines being made for the mutant overexpressing this protein compared to the strain that was unable to produce it. Moreover, uh, because BONCAT is a proteomic method, we were able to um, 
distinguish uh, between and see changes for things that were post-transcriptionally regulated um, as opposed to transcriptionally regulated. And just in general, I think there's less known about this. So, so we decided for these various reasons um, that we wanted to understand what it did. And so before I'm going to show you our beginning insight into the molecular mechanism of what this thing does, um, what I want to go back to is why do we call this thing SUT-A? And the fact that we selected it because we saw it expressed and synthesized and made under both anaerobic but also aerobic conditions. Well, from data that I, I didn't have time to show you, when we were doing all those microelectrode experiments in the CF sputum mucus, what we found was that in some patients we would see really amazing swings in redox state. And if you think about it, of course, there's going to be incredible dynamism going on in the lung. Every time some individual coughs, you can imagine you know, disturbance and perturbation to the oxygen content. And so um, it's not enough to just think about something in a static uh, environmental state. It's always going to, you know, the Dynamics are very important. And so we thought, well, what if we were to vacillate um, and change from aerobic to anaerobic survival conditions back to aerobic, um, anaerobic survival, and do this many times and transfer, would we see a difference in fitness uh, for this interesting mutant um, that we had found? And sure enough, we saw a significant difference. Um, the wild type was, when competed with this mutant, much more competitive uh, under this uh, dynamic change of um, environmental state. And that actually winds up making a great deal of sense because when we went the next step to try to figure out what this protein um, does, uh, what we found is that this, this small protein, it has, I mean, I guess small is relative, I should say, with um, Gigi in the audience, this is only 105 amino acids, 11 KD protein. Um, it was completely unknown. It was interesting. It had this very um, large acidic end terminal region. And to our great surprise um, and kind of delight, when we did a co-IP experiment where we were looking to see what did this protein physically interact with in the cell, what really came out very strongly and very significantly um, was uh, uh, RNAP, the RNA polymerase. Um, these are different parts of RNA polymerase that strongly associate with SUD-A, which stands for survival under transitions. And so the details of how um, it interacts with RNA polymerase are uh, aspects that we're now actively pursuing and I'm happy to talk about later. Um, suffice it to say for now that the impact this little protein has is actually quite broad globally. And so in doing RNA-seq experiments and chip-seq experiments, we could see where this protein um, was having an effect genome-wide. And I think the most important aspect, at least for me, that came out of this was was that when we looked at the comparison between our overexpression strain and our deletion strain, and we were looking at the RNA uh, from these two different strains, and we were looking at which classes of genes are enriched in being um, upregulated or in being repressed um, as a function of, of this little sud A protein, uh, what we found is that compared now, the way you read this is here are these different categories of cellular functions, and in black is the fraction of the genome that can be broadly classified in these different ways. In color is the amount of uh, transcripts that we were able to see corresponding to these classes. And I think what's really important uh, to note here is that um, there was a real enrichment of um, genes that are annotated as being involved in maintenance and secondary metabolism. This, this little protein helps to upregulate. Um, and there's a significant downregulation in classes of genes involved in motility, defense, and signaling. And of course, in both cases, we have a large fraction of genes of unknown function um, that I would like to uh, stipulate are unknown because we've been doing experiments only in a very limited um, window of conditions. And as we expand our thinking about what the actual environment is that we seek to um, understand in the laboratory, we'll more and more reduce this unknown uh, group and better appreciate the physiology of cells in context. So as one example, um, it brings me back to the important point, which is that in the environment, in many environments, whether it's within the context of sediments, um, you know, in a reservoir holding potable water supplies, or within the lungs of individuals with cystic fibrosis, 
Organisms in these environments, bacteria and microbes of all flavors, are growing by and large slowly and, and have had many um, eons of time in which to adapt strategies that allow them to be successful. And so I think we actually have a lot to learn sometimes by, by making these jumps in our thinking and trying to ask what is it that um, these environments have in common and how might organisms that are known to transition from the soil into you know, the human host have evolved that allow them to be so successful. And so with that, I'll point out that you know, the Earth is a really complex system and so is the human body. And in order to understand uh, any of these systems, we must embrace both the complexity of that environment and try to characterize it at the same time, we embrace the power of reductionist experimental laboratory work so that we can design our experiments in ways that ultimately have the most meaning. And so on that note, I'll end by thanking um, a phenomenal group of um, people who have, throughout the time of my lab, contributed to the development of these ideas. Here I'm showing you photos of just the most recent key figures. Um, this is the team at CHLA that we worked with um, at their pulmonary clinic that has provided the most welcome of homes um, and been just a wonderful group of people uh, with whom to collaborate. Um, but the vast majority of the experimental work that I showed you today was really done by four um, very talented people, three of whom are students, Sebastian Kopf, a uh, geochemist who's starting his own lab at UC Boulder this fall, um, my student uh, Nate Glazer, and Brett Babin, whom I jointly mentor with uh, Dave Terrell, and my postdoc, um, Megan Bergesell. And I, because I'm here at the NIH, I want to say one additional thing in my acknowledgments, which is that a lot of what I talked about today um, came from being fortunate to receive one of these transformative research awards about four years ago. And I'm really, really grateful um, <laughs> to the selection committee who gave us the opportunity to try to adapt some of these tools from the world of geochemistry into this context because, at least for me personally, it's been a very exciting journey and I think has allowed us to develop methods that hopefully are more broad in their application and relevant um, well beyond the specific context um, in which we develop them. So I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you very much again uh, for the honor of being invited here to give this seminar. That was really great. Um, with, responding, uh, with respect to another model system, there are <clears throat> there is a, a lot of work being done on organisms uh, that live within other organisms, and these endosymbionts uh, are um, often bacteria, sometimes fungi, but they make a home in another organism, and there's a very common. Uh, bacteria, Wolbachia, this is alpha proteobacteria, it's probably in 50% of the in insects, and there are many strains of this. But um, these, bacteria, these or endosymbionts have to survive um, by the grace of the host, and one of the things they've learned to do, uh, in cooperation with the host probably, is to grow very slowly. And there's always, you know, there's a lot of work on why do they grow so slowly. Sometimes the host makes peptides or microRNAs, or, but the organisms themselves, the endo endosymbionts also, you know, participate in this. And so that would be an interesting, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are working on it. That would be an in interesting model. The insects actually have an organ called a bacterium that is filled with bacteria sites that are filled with the endosymbiont. So you can just pluck that out and, and look within that organ. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic example. Um, it's really incredible how many examples you can 
actually th think about, where slow growth physiology is so important, whether even in wastewater treatment. <laughs> uh, there's so many contexts, and yet I think at a, at a detailed molecular level, how it is that the cells in these slow growth states actually achieve basic processes of transcription and translation and membrane you know, maintenance, um, uh, there's a lot more to learn there still. Yes, in terms of when you were speaking of biofilms and you were talking about, if I understood correctly, certain types of mutants in terms of making uh, bacteria so they can't produce biofilms, this would be a further significance than, than what you're implying because in the idea of medical devices, et cetera, the biofilms is a huge problem and there's a million and one uh, now papers out in terms of uh, t solutions for this. Now, if you could figure out a way to make biofilms mutant, as in contrast to try to combat them with antibiotics, which isn't effective because, you know, they, a lot of the new hypothesis said they're in layers, like one layer protects them, the other one's active. You can go through the literature and find all that, but you would really have something, just saying, gee, we're going to figure out a way to make the biofilm and this guy who's got a pacemaker uh, infection go away by, by introducing a mutant strain of what you've cultured out of them. And I, I just suggested that as a what if and perhaps something you could speculate on, eh? Sure. I'm just smiling because I'm working on finishing a R01 application that's very, uh, very related to that, and thinking about how one might, you know, undermine biofilm structure by going after these type of metabolites that can help sustain as a novel therapeutic approach. Um, I think that. There's a lot still we have to do in order to know if that's a viable strategy, but I think it rationally makes sense. It's very different. You know, um, there are many different ways one can begin to think creatively when you embrace the um, importance of metabolism and sustaining these, and then thinking about how can you perturb metabolism or how can you, yeah, interfere with whatever is sustaining that mode of metabolism in a creative new way that can either disintegrate biofilms or can potentiate their activity in such a way that allows for conventional antibiotics to be more effective, I think these are really important um, aspects to try with a lot of potential. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, so maybe it's related, but so, that, so obviously if you have a metabolite, not only the guy that put it out can use it, but other guys can and vice versa. Do you have any sense from any of your localization or anything else whether how much sharing there is and if bacteria A didn't make this, would somebody else? Yes, we <laughs> have thought a lot about that. Um, so I, I don't have any evidence from that localization that because that's so new we haven't yet been able to identify who's making what, but what we do have is from bulk sequencing. Um, in the same studies where we looked at heightened thiocyanin concentration over time in CF lungs, we saw a real winnowing and restricting of the microbial um, diversity in these patients. And though there's not um, one particular organism that always tracks with the rise of Pseudomonas, one thing that is clear is that there's a rise in anaerobes um, that occupy the same niche. And what it suggests is that potentially those organisms are benefiting from the phenazines. And one small inroad we've made into understanding one way they might benefit is to isolate from the soil mycobacteria that can eat phenazines as a carbon source. And some of these um, are the kind of mycobacteria that you find within CF. It's actually a growing pathogen, some of the rapidly growing non-tuberculosis uh, mycobacteria increasingly are found, at least in the CF Center that we collaborate with. And so um, it's an area that uh, I would love to learn more about and I think is one of the next frontiers for this research. Yeah. Uh, do you have any idea what the primary carbon source is for the pseudomonas in the lung? The primary carbon source, um, I wish I could say there was a primary carbon source. Um, in experiments that have been done to measure all the different forms of carbon, there is a large diversity of carbon sources. Um, what I think is fair to say is that glucose is probably not the most important at all. Um, and some very good work I can refer you to from Marvin Whiteley's group. Um, uh, began to measure some of the metabolites and construct a synthetic CF sputum medium. Um, I know that lactate is found at reasonably high abundance, um, and I'd have to go back and check concentrations of other short-chain fatty acids and other carbon sources, but it's um, 
quite complex. I wouldn't think it's just one. I think there's a lot of different carbon. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to make two quick announcements. One, there will be a reception in the library um, following this talk, immediately following this talk. And secondly, um, Dr. Newman has kindly agreed to give another talk tomorrow for the normal Lambda lunch time at 11 o'clock in uh, the sixth floor conference room in building 37. Um, now I just want to thank Dr. Newman for a, such a very interesting talk.